Hey everyone, welcome to a book video. Tried this before, but because it's been a while since I've read some of these, I goofed a bit, um, kind of rambled. So I went and had some lunch, came back, have a cup of tea. But you, you don't care about any of that, you just want to know about the books. So these are all nonfiction and history. So if you are wanting to know about fiction or game related books, uh, none in this video, but thanks for checking it out. I'll see you next video. But if you like nonfiction, history, uh, give it a watch. I'll go ahead and go through all the books I'm going to talk about, and I'll talk about each of them briefly. And considering it is now boiling hot back here, it might be very brief. Okay, well first up, uh, Narciss, Hammer of the Goths. History of the Goths by Jordanes, or Gothic History dash uh, the origin and deeds of the Goths. Several names on that one. The Byzantine Art of War, Justinian II of Byzantium, Alexander's Veterans and the Early Wars of These Successors, and Invisible Romans. Kind of put them in some sort of theme here. Byzantine, okay. Uh, first, I'll go over Narciss, Hammer of the Goths. I would recommend reading all of these if the subject interests you. And this one is on Narciss. This is the only book I know of dedicated to him. He was a general of Justinian and a eunuch. <clears throat> I think he was also um, in charge of the treasury at some point. Uh, Narciss finished the wars in Italy uh, to reconquer them. Belisarius had originally been to Italy, was recalled. Um, Narciss, there was, there's a long period uh, where Narciss was uh, sent back to Constantinople. He eventually went back, defeated the Goths. Uh, there's also a bunch of mystery surrounding him. He apparently had this vast buried treasure. Um, <clears throat> there's also rumors that he gave Italy up to the Longbards. Uh, the book does cover that. The book also covers some of the, uh, the construction projects that were under his reign. He was also the Exarch of Ravenna. So you have things like he would help repair the walls of Rome. He built a bridge. Uh, the bridge is no longer there, but there is a drawing from, I think, the 1600s when it still was. You also learn about the battles he fought. <clears throat> he fought a few uh, famous ones. And while Belisarius was more a defensive general, Narciss, uh, his victories came largely from how he deployed his forces. He was very good at using a, a mixed army. So uh, ranged cavalry and archers with infantry. Uh, entertaining book covers a little bit of everything. You get uh, his life before, or what they know of him before. Uh, they believe he was Armenian, but you don't know too much about his life before uh, appearing at the court. But you hear a lot about his life at the court, uh, his campaign in Italy, and uh, his administration in Ravenna afterwards. <clears throat> Next up, the Gothic history of Jordanes. Now, I once read that people should be careful when they read the Historia Augusta, because it can it can confuse them. So unless they're well read on that period, they should they should kind of he be hesitant about reading it. I never quite understood what that meant until I read this, and that's because this book is all over the place. Now every people create foundation myths. Uh, the Franks had one about their first king was the son of a woman and a god. I want to say, well, Jordanes does, and in the foreword to this, he says. This is just a summary of other works he wrote over a three-day period for a friend of his. But the further back you get from when he wrote this, which is about 550, the more ridiculous it gets. It gets so ridiculous, I don't, I don't know why he put it in the book. So let me just go to the beginning. Um, now, he does say the Goths migrated from a place called Scanza. Uh, they do, they being, uh, from what I've read, the general... Um, Historians in general believe that he's referring to a migration from Scandinavia, which did take place in, I believe, the 200s. However, he goes all the way back to before the Persians fought the Greeks. According to him, the Goths migrated down. They, they split at a river. Uh, they, these two groups kind of went on their own separate adventures. They would meet back up, raid, pillage. Uh, but to show the time frame he's working with, he says at one point a group uh, sacked Troy again. Keep in mind, he's referring to um, Homer. He's saying the Goths went and sacked Troy about a decade after the Greeks, which is thousands, there's like a thousand plus year difference there. 
He also said that the Goths fought. Uh, there is a mythical Egyptian pharaoh that is said to have invaded Europe. He said the Goths fought and defeated him. He also said when Xerxes in, uh, invaded, uh, will cross the Hellespont to go attack the Greeks, that he never fought the Greeks. Instead, he saw the Goths, got so scared he ran back to Persia. He also said at one point, as I go down to Asia Minor, the men decide to go get some food, supplies, raid. Uh, and while they're gone, the women are attacked. The women defend themselves and realize they're so good at fighting, they're going to keep this up. So they go to the, the place where their attackers came from, defeat them, and eventually become the Amazons. Now, think about the time compression of that. The men would have to be gone for years for this to happen. But the way Jordanes writes it is that the men just kind of go away for a few weeks, come back. In the meantime, the women have become the Amazons, have conquered all these lands, then pick back up with the men and head out. So that's what I'm talking about when I say it's very confusing. He also frequently confuses the Goths for the Geats and for the Dacians. Uh, he says it's them and the Dacians and primarily them that fought the Emperor Roman Emperor Domitian uh, during the Flavian Wars against Dacia. Uh, what else? It's just all over the place. Now, the closer you get to the 550s, the more accurate it gets, and that's when it's very useful. Uh, this book, which you'll see, this green border, it's a series this publisher puts out. They do a lot of helpful things, like they put little uh, descriptions of what the paragraphs are about. So you see migration of the Amali to the Visigoths right here, embassy to Attila's right here. So it does a really uh, good job of breaking down the information. Uh, there are extensive notes, and at some point they just kind of give up uh, pointing out the inaccuracies. And so, yeah... You spend a lot of your time just trying to parse out what's real and what's not and trying to put everything in chronological order in your mind because you'll read something that should have happened, say, a thousand years earlier. He's saying it happened uh, basically a year after something that happened four years ago. So you're just the whole time you're trying to parse everything out to not be confused. And so the, the, the probably first half or so of this book can get really confusing. Uh, that's why I said you have to be careful. But afterwards, you get uh, Valentinian I, uh, the Visigoths settle in Thrace, uh, treachery of the Romans. Of course, everything that goes on is not the Goths' fault. Uh, the Romans are terrible, so the Goths have to right their wrongs. But then the Goths will just go raid and sack, and that's okay because the Romans weren't defending them well enough, and they're they're not defending them well enough, and they might as well go sack and raid them because, you know, not their fault. You left them open. We had to go take it. So yeah, uh, the earliest work that covers Gothic history, so it's, it's interesting in that regard, and you do get a lot of good information after that, but you just have to be very careful with it. But just as a history of the Goths, and you get to, it's interesting to see foundation myths at work, someone crafting their own foundation myths. Uh, next up is Justinian II of Byzantium. Interesting character, this is the only book I know of him, so if you are interested, definitely pick this up came out in the 60s, I believe. So some of the stuff I've read is outdated. However, I don't have access to journal articles to know how exactly it's correct or incorrect. Um, it is known that he was an absolute monarch and he did try to strip power from the aristocracy by giving some to the more common people. But the extent of that is debated. There's a land reform law that either he initiated or that just happened to be coming around while he was in power. Uh, why he's interesting is because he ruled for 10 years, was deposed, then came back after exile and ruled for about seven or eight more years. Um, he's also called the Gold Nose. Uh, going back, he is of the Heraclean dynasty. So his ancestor was Heraclius, who was the first emperor to fight the Muslim armies. His dad was Constantine IV, who is the emperor that stopped the uh, Islamic expansion after about half a century. His grandfather was Constance II, who actually was considering moving the capital to Syracuse, but was killed while he was taking a bath. Now, he ruled for 10 years, was deposed, had his nose cut off, because, uh, and they let him live, because basically the rule was that the emperor should have no disfigurements. So it was kind of assumed without a nose, he can never become emperor again. However, it said he had a gold nose crafted, went to live in exile along the Black Sea while he was gone, linked up with uh, the Bulgars, one of the tribes, married a princess of Akan, came back to, or went back down to Constantinople, 
overthrew the usurper, and this been about a decade in exile, took over, gruesomely executed him in the Hippodrome, ruled, some say despotically. Uh, this author is a little bit more forgiving to him, uh, but he was a harsh ruler and was eventually killed. Um, this book covers his early life, his life in exile, and the, the kind of the reforms and laws he was into. A uh, bit of, a, like I said, absolute monarch, but did some to, did seem to want to reform some, uh, primarily to weaken the aristocracy, but that would have benefited the common people. And so he was actually uh, especially despised because of that and because he had a uh, bulger wife. However, he seemed to have been pretty dedicated to her. Definitely an interesting character, and this is the only book I could find on him. So grab that if you're interested. Then there's The Byzantine Art of War. Now, if you get this, definitely get... John Haldon's The Byzantine Wars. Uh, this book is referenced frequently in, frequently in this. These have kind of different approaches. This book uh, covers a war, but by covering a war, which we'll cover in detail, you get battle maps. He gives you backgrounds on the commanders, uh, kind of like the political and social backgrounds of the time the wars went on, the evolutions that had gone on between the parties in terms of warfare and uh, territorial expansion. This takes a much broader overview and covers hundreds and hundreds. And hundreds. This one covers hundreds of years at very specific points, but this covers 100, hundreds and hundreds of years in broad strokes. You do get, he might cover a battle in a few paragraphs, but this one will take pages. That's, that's pretty much the difference. Uh, this one also talks about armor. Uh, let me see, oh, this is a, a section on siege warfare. So you get descriptions, uh, drawings, uh, not too many, but here's a section on armor. So this one will cover organization, famous commanders, uh, armor, the evolution of the themes, which were military districts. Uh, so this one, get, you get a, like I said, a broad overview with a few battles covered. This one's very specific. This would seem to be a companion to this, but... This is referenced so much and goes into such more detail for each war. And it, it's a really, Halden does a good job of laying out information by battle that you, this one is much more clear and concise. However, this is helpful. So if you want one, definitely pick up both. They're not that expensive. Uh, this one's much more readily available, uh, but definitely go ahead and grab both. Next up is Alexander's Veterans and the Early Wars of the Successors. This book basically, uh, how do I put this, tries to hit a few major points, one of which is that the veterans do not have as much of an influence as the sources determine, that the veterans were not as uh, raucous as the sources predict uh, uh, portray them, and basically how they never really got their way. Uh, essentially, you get comparisons with the, the rank and file and the generals, in the sense that if the if a general lied to the troops and said, your money and food's coming and it never arrived, then they were just being clever. But if the troops finally got fed up with being lied to or going hungry or poor, and they kind of, you know, not a full-blown mutiny, but there were murmurs about it, how they were terrible, disloyal, etc. A lot of examples of between those, how, you know, one general, is he lies, but that's considered clever, and how when the troops get upset over actual... Uh, you know, legitimate reasons to be upset, it's viewed negatively. Also points out that the troops never really had much sway because uh, while they could always uh, agree on what they didn't like, they could never agree on what they like did they want to do about it. Uh, and because their generals are always as core nobility, they were always unified when the troops started to get upset. But the troops, while being massive and more numerous, they could never come to terms on what should be done about what's upsetting them. So while they could agree on what they didn't like, they didn't agree on how to go about fixing it or about what they wanted to do about it. Um, and that division is ultimately why they never had that much power. Uh, there are a few instances pointed out where they seem things have been bubbling up to the surface and they, they were about to get control. And then because they could never... Uh, become cohesive and form into a, gr a solid group with a, a leading body among the troops. Uh, also points out that the few people who did rise high in the ranks uh, from the rank and file that could have been a, a good influence on the what the everyday troop wanted were either killed or sent away. 
Um, so and you get the, uh, a lot on the interactions of the successors with the troops, how they treated the veterans, uh, the veterans' combat record, um, how it compared against younger troops sent from Macedonia's reinforcements or locally raised troops. So if you're just interested in the rank and file perspective, this is a, a really interesting uh, look on the early wars of the, of the wars of successors, in particular the early wars, like it says, uh, but from a, a, a unique uh, viewpoint. And on the topic of unique viewpoints, Invisible Romans, this looks at pretty much everyone else but the elite. And since most of the work we have are from the senatorial class, that is the higher uh, echelon, like the top, top, top uh, of, the, of the heap. They are the most wealthy. And the discrepancy back then of wealth is vast. So, you know, the majority of the people were poor, struggling. So this book covers the ordinary men and women, slaves, freedmen, soldiers, gladiators, uh, and pirates and bandits. You get a lot of great anecdotes, such as letters from home from soldiers. Um, you get the guy uses uh, Robert Knapp uses scrolls and spells that have been found. So it kind of shows what the common people were concerned about. You know, if they're going to go get a spell cast, it would show what they were wanting to happen, what their aspirations were, or what they were really nervous about. Um, why someone would turn to outlaw and banditry, why someone would become a soldier. You, you hear the stories of people cutting off their thumbs to avoid military service. Well, this goes through several stories of parents really wanting their kids to join the army because there was high unemployment um, and underemployment. So the idea of getting a full-time job was, you know, that was a huge step up. It actually, it was one of the, the army is one of the few places with actual career advancement. So p parents really wanted their kids to join. Um, a lot of uh, tombstones were checked out to see kind of the, the the gist of what people were concerned about in terms of the afterlife, how a lot of them spoke about what they did in their life. Uh, basically, I, I was a merchant. I sailed the seas. I had six kids, and I'm laying here. So it gives a broad overview of kind of the classes that were able to afford that, what the poor classes could afford, the struggles of all of the classes, uh, the laws that kept them in check, um, a big theme is how they do not trust the court system. Uh, a lot of references to the Bible and to the Torah. Um, the Torah is, the sto is one of the stories where parents want their son to become a soldier. Uh, Bible is referenced heavily in terms of the courts, how you do not want to go to a court. There's a bunch of uh, fables that are explained. You know, uh, you'll read it here and it might be about a snake and a mole and you don't quite get it. But he'll explain why the symbolism, symbolism is important to people of the day how the court system was really unfair to the average person. You want to do your best to avoid it, and a lot of stories to, that basically say that without saying it because you're not supposed to uh, you know, be vocal about that. But just if you're interested in the common person, definitely check this out. Uh, very interesting. It's a word I've been saying a lot in this video, but true, all these books offer a little something different. So I definitely recommend Invisible Romans. All right, everyone. Thanks for watching.